Hi everybody. So let's clap your hand. I'm joking. <laughs> so I'm Augusto. I'm one of the founder of Mashape, uh, founder CEO of Mashape. It's a company that I found in 2010, and I grew up in Italy, so I'm of this part of the world. And then I moved to San Francisco uh, in late 2010, and uh, and here we are back now. So I'm going to talk about the art of selling APIs. So the business models. Uh, the way you can make money, the way you can't make money, and the overall the market and how it's moving and how it's evolving and the direction it's taking. So this is the first big data that if one day you have to go to a venture capital and then they always have concern about how big is the market and how many customers there are out there. So according to Stack Overflow, this number is actually, I did this in um, February. I do one edition once a year. And this number is now over 30 million. But around the world, there are 30 million of developers that have credit cards on f that can put on file and they can pay you easily. And have a lot of decision power nowadays into every enterprise. And they have money and they can move money. So 30 million is a big enough number where you can sell all your APIs or your data. And I think this is the first thing that we have to bring to the table when we talk about the API economy. And actually, it's going up very, very fast because of um, skills to be a developer are decreasing, and the demand is increasing across every sector in every economy. That means that we're going to eat probably 100 million developers um, in 10 years. So this number is growing very, very fast and faster every year. Also, China and India are driving that growth. So we can switch this to. So what's happening is that APIs are entering in every sector, from hardware to software to agriculture to medicine. They're basically everywhere. Um, and the reason why is that it's really changing the way you develop software. Probably today you have listened to this uh, 10,000 of times, but now it's an API first, and then you build a software on top of it. So what's happening here is that there is a wave of hardware as well, wearable device, that are driving that API economy under, underneath. So when you think about mobile, it's not just the iPhone, but it's every device connected to the internet as well. And um, so you have the Pebble, uh, uh, NASA, GM. So this is a good thing. GM for developers. So General Motors, they do cars. But they're now having developers program. What is selling you uh, through APIs? What is telling you is a company not related with technology at all are now having developers programs and API business, in a way, uh, Walgreens and many others. Uh, Ford, UE, and um, HP is now releasing their unsuccessful cloud services for now. But they're really investing money in their API platform a lot. And, um, and then, obviously, we have a uh, government as well, uh, the Chicago Transit Authority. And um, few people know that, but United States, have uh, the government have 300 APIs already published across every every .dot gov uh, uh, vector? So that's a pretty impressive number, and they're going up to 1,000. So I I see that around the world, every government will exchange data through APIs, and eventually will sell data. Not sure about selling, but for sure they will find some business model on top of that, uh, like uh, crimes in the city, transportations. And developers can build on top and tap the data that are being locked for many, many years from every city, every government around the world. Uh, oops. So API always exists. Like 30 years ago, we always had APIs. I think it's a foundation. What's happening now is the cloud API. So it's the API connected to the internet. So there are APIs that are exchanging data through the internet. So we call it cloud APIs. Um, now we get into the business model. So when you have an API, you have to charge for something. And the main one is usually API call. And it's the most across every stack. So every time a client ping a server, that's an API call. And then you can charge for zero point, usually 0 0.0001 cent per API call on average. But depends on what your business, what your margins are. 
but you can uh, monetize in a world of different way, like MongoHQ, which is MongoDB as a service. They uh, basically use megabytes as a standard unit. So you can have multiple units, face detection, query, uh, data point, if you're like um, uh, GIMP or like uh, analyzing um, social data, you're probably gonna charge for data point. SMS, if you're like Twilio. Uh, but there are all kinds of things. There is a porn filter, if we want to filter porn. So everything that is your core business unit, you can apply to your API business unit and you can sell it as it is. Obviously, API call is always the underneath form of um, the basic unit, but still, you can actually, it's better to charge per this object rather than API calls. Because you have to learn, I mean, what we learn in these years is that API uh, developers are very, very, very bad in estimating API calls. So if you give them a plan of, let's say, $5 a month, and they have 50,000 API calls, they may buy it, but in their head, they don't know that actually their apps will use 500,000 API calls, so they will go in overcharges or problems. They, they will know usually when it's too late and they get overcharges. So API call is very, very good for you because you know exactly how much you're consuming, but it's bad for developers that they buy because they're very bad at estimating their peak and their higher eye and their lower lower when they build on top of your API. So you will have problem. Instead, if you do space detection and they're building a photo app, they know that they're filtering 50,000 photos, no matter how many API calls it takes. So they know that they have 50,000 face detections per day. So it's a clear number, a clear unit that they can understand. Um, this is the economy as a whole. We, those three things didn't exist like five years ago. And now we clearly have them in every major startup that is growing fast and also in the many major company that is moving to be a technology company. And you have API engineer, which is usually the guy that works both on the public API and both on the private APIs, internal APIs inside the company. And uh, he basically it's maintaining the API, developing the API, and the sysadmin behind the API. And usually there are more API engineers as your API business gets bigger. And the API evangelist, it's usually the guy that does unconventional business development for the developers. So usually go long tail, and take care about your community. And then you have API business development is more like top-down sales approach where you do enterprise to enterprise. But those three, you have to think about that five years ago, no one was hiring those people and there weren't demand for those people and now they reach. So this is a pretty big shift in just five years of how software is sold, consumed, and distributed across basically the entire stack. We have... Um, this is a very big number, but already thousands of employees around the world that work to create value in this economy that is pre pretty much new, but already thousands. Obviously, the big boys, Amazon, AWS, are driving the majority of this. So if you, if you go on AWS job page today, you get 600 open positions. So it's a company growing, it's like a startup that's hiring 600 people, and it's growing very, very fast. So they're and Google are driving the majority of this. But still, overall, counting small startup, bigger startup, it's thousands and thousands of employees working this market, getting a paycheck of around 10,000 per month. So it's a lot, a lot of revenue that get distributed to these people. Uh, this is a, so this, this is a, a basic, I mean, you already know this, but it's a cool, I think it's like, when you go and you build a cake, you usually buy it by the, the ingredients, right? And so you have to think about your business as a, a cake, and then you have all the ingredients that you have to buy to build that cake, and APIs are just the ingredients for that. So Salesforce and eBay were the first one starting this, um, in uh, public and, and opening up an API in 2001. And um, you have to think that at the beginning it was only big, big companies doing this. And it, and it was very low adoption, very low was Yahoo, Google, Facebook. And then after, I think, um, Twitter around 2008, 2009, something changed and you got a very big acceleration because even startups of three people started to have APIs. And the reason why is because they were going mobile and to do that, they need an API first. And then eventually they open it up 20% of what it is. But this is a very interesting trend where for basically seven years, nothing happened, only five, seven dinos are released APIs, and they were actually the leader for that. 
And now every single company is pushing out APIs or is driven by APIs and is accelerating. So we'll have millions and millions of APIs in the near future. This is the first real, well, they may not be the most well-known, but it's for sure the, one of the most successful uh, API startup born in the last uh, five years. And actually they were, I think, the first to really born as an API company, which means API is their core product, API is their core business, API is, so, is their soul. And the Twilio was really the, the example of that because they, they really sold that technology only through API and that's the only interface they had. So this is really, they start first and obviously they gain momentum. What's interesting here is that you have now 60 SMS API companies in the world. So they have 59 competitors and that number is going up. So even SMS business, because of API is growing, it can be commoditized in a way that you need an SMS and you have 60 choice and you're just, just gonna choose the one that it depends on your local, like uh, if you're in Indonesia, you're gonna use the SMS API company in Indonesia because they have better pricing. And actually the reason why there are so many SMS API companies is because location, location, it's very, very important because the pricing is way better if you can partner with the company uh, underneath in that specific country. They run on level three, but they can mainly but if, if, a, if a small startup come, let's say, in French and they go directly with Orange, that they do have API that no one is using. But if they go to Orange directly, they can create a better infrastructure than Twilio. So now there are 60 SMS API companies around the world. And you will see this in every single vertical. So in sentiment analysis, there was um, Alchemy API. Now there are 85 sentiment analysis companies through APIs. So in every single vertical, there was one, and now there are many. So the competition, is going very, very fast and at the end as a developer, better for you because you, you can decide what's the best solution with the best pricing and best long-term sustainability. So this is taken by the famous John Master from Programma Web, I don't know if he's here, uh, the conference, he's from Seattle. And um, it's, he did a very good job in explaining all the business model, but it's interesting how in 2005 there were few and now there are a lot, a lot of sub groups on how you can monetize the API. Obviously, every business is different, but we'll go through the main ones. So I put some example left or right, but we can say that this is, I think, the first where it's not, it's not it, it changed a bit in, in the case of Facebook, but still what, what's representing is that you give your platform for free and people build on top and there you take revenue shares of whatever they may be making on top of you. So using the API, it's free, and but indirectly they make money through, through revenue sharing. It, it was very popular in uh, 2008, uh, 2007, 2009, and I think till 2010. Um, then they changed their strategy. But it's still a business model if you have a platform. The, the, the problem is getting first the, a successful product, and then you open and you become a platform. Developers pay, this is the most user one, like Twilio. I use 10 SMS, I pay Twilio 10 SMS. Uh, Amazon Web Services, I, I, I use EC2 computational power and I pay for whatever I use. Um, so it's pretty much developers pay you. Uh, you do uh, sentiment analysis, face detection, and I pay you as an API provider. And it's the most common API business model, and also the most simple to understand for developers, because one thing they really have problem nowadays in understanding the pricing and the implication if things goes like crazy and how much are gonna pay. So that's just like really the fear. Remember that in the IT, uh, it's changing finally, but in the IT, developers never pay. Usually it's the sysadmin that pays a lot of money, like New Relic, they go and pay New Relic a lot of money. The DevOps pays, but the developer, the front-end engineer, usually don't want to pay. So it's, it's changing, but it's still as low as low changing. So the better they understand the pricing, the more likely they will pay you. Developers get paid. So this is um, a pretty much uh, a revenue sharing affiliate marketing where I pay you every time you give me value. So if you drive me more customer through the API, I will do revenue sharing for the additional customer that you provide me. Uh, RDO, it's an example. Every time they give you through APIs, you send them more subscribers, then you do revenue sharing. Uh, now I think Box is doing that with Open Box. So every time uh, they build an app and they send 
people that then eventually subscribe to the bot box uh, three four subscriptions plan, they do revenue sharing. So it's pretty good to give rewards to developers that are sending you customers directly or indirectly. It's hard to put in place. Like it's not that simple. Like the other one, you put a billing three pricing and run. This is more complex to put in place uh, if you're a small startup and you need a couple backend engineer to work on that. This is um, uh, an example can be, so the New York Times is not doing this anymore. But what they used to do is uh, you, use a, you, you want to retrieve uh, metadata and data from the New York Times article, and then it's obviously free. But then, for example, they can push in, in the API stream uh, ads. So then you get more eyeballs, because indirectly you're showing New York Times ads around multiple apps that are built on top of New York Times content. Even if that is free, there's the obligation to show advertisement. So indirectly, they monetize more, because they get more distribution for that. Uh, this is an example of um, an API that does face recognition. And um, it's basically a pricing for the long tail. And what we discovered with um, with this is that the best price is uh, for a developer of a long tail is nine bucks. So with nine dollars, he doesn't think he just straight out and he starts to pay you. Obviously, the freemium model is essential. But if you have the first, if you, the first plan should be nine, not ten, because psychologically ten is a big number. So you go with nine, and um, and that has a lot, a lot of adoption. Then they start to put the system in place. The apps grow, and then they obviously will upgrade as their business grows. And if it doesn't grow, then they will shut it down. But still, you get more paid users if you put below 10 bucks. So, but if you put five, it doesn't really change the conversion rate. What we understand is that if you put five or 10, uh, sorry, nine or five, it doesn't really matter. You can put nine and have the same number of customers, but they will pay you nine a month instead of five. The, the, the psychology problem is then when you go to 10. And then, uh, and then they start to think more. And then obviously 19, the same things when you go to, you know, to the Carrefour and, and you buy stuff and you're 9.99. And um, so this is the long tail, and they in, that, in their case, they they uh, monetize through two main uh, limits: detections and recognitions. So, let's like say in the freemium plan, just zero to go, and you get 400 face detection a month, and then um, uh, face recognition 100, and and then you get 0 0.1 extra. So it's quite inexpensive if you do a lot of processing, and 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 then they go also they have features, so you can put multiple features per plan, like, I don't know, the Ultra, you can provide um, support 24 hours, and the basic, you support support just by email with the 48 hours turnaround. around. But to, to have people paying you more, you obviously have to put more, f other than limits, but also more feature inside each, each plan. And um, obviously, this guy has also private plans that provides to the enterprise or private companies, so it's not, they're not gonna see that, like a company arrive and say, hey, I want more than 200,000 a month. I want two millions. And then they will provide a custom plan to them. Or a, a university come in and say, or a no-profit, and then they will provide the same amount for free because it's a no-profit organization. So you always have to adapt per customer, but you keep on the website um, a, long t a long tail pricing for everyone. But you will always have to adapt one by one a couple of times where someone knocks at your door and needs different pricing. So you have to have a billing solution in place that it's able to adapt quickly and release a billing the way the customer wants. Because here you probably cover the majority, but there is always some people that need more, especially when they, especially when they go big. And request more from you, so more features. SLA is probably the most important thing for a company that, big companies that want, that want to rely on you, they always ask for that. So you see uh, multiple plans. Um, Limits and features. Pretty much the SaaS business model that you have on Box, on Dropbox, on Zendesk. Easily, this is the best to understand for a developer, and they're gonna pay you. Um, and uh, it's it's also the faster to implement. Direct, which is, is the direct one. Then there's the pay as you go. It's um, like Twilio, for example. It's pay as you go. You get thirty thousand SMS, and you pay me thirty bucks, and and then and then you move out from there. So the pay as you go. It's also an interesting one. The problem is that you can't control the cost. So when you have a lot of traction, you're gonna pay a lot of money. And then with this one, it's easy to ask for a refund if something goes wrong. With this other one, it's harder to ask for a refund if you're a customer because pay as you go is pretty much, you accept that. There is no really refund for that. 
Um, and then uh, in this case, it's a um, filter to put filter like Instagram. And then you have 100 per month. And then you have all the features in it. And then you just go paying every day based on, obviously, I can pull out your money every day or every month. That depends from the API providers. But you pay as much as you consume. It's cool because you don't have to pay nothing up front. But if you have a freemium model, you basically, this is the best solution. So uh, a little bit of history here. Uh, AWS was the first API is the product. So eBay, Salesforce, they released open APIs. But this was the first one that really was their product, their business, actually, and a real business. You have to think that AWS, in 2007, so a year, a year and a half when they launched, already had 330,000 developers on their platform. Now no one knows how many millions of developers they have. But just a year and a half after, they had so many developers. 330,000, it's um, 100,000 bigger than what it is Twilio now, uh, after 100 million in funding and six years. And they reached that, that community uh, super fast. So you have, this is a real business. And uh, now API is the product. There are many, many, many more. So if you go to like Y Combinator or Techstar two times a year, what you discover is that compared to a few years ago, every new class has more API is the product business and startups, always. And uh, so we have all this um, uh, from uh, point filter to urban airship for push notification, um, education market and um, mu uh, music metadata, songs. So there are all kind of uh, APIs the company. Braintree, this is a whole data. They're pro processing way more than that. But what I'm showing you here is that startups can re be a real business since day one. Um, they do now 12 billions in, uh, per, per year. Uh, or actually, more than a billion a month now. So the overall revenue uh, uh, on the public data that we have are around 100 million. And now it's uh, over three billion. Obviously, there are the big players here that drives a lot of this. This is direct revenue, so I pay A pays B. And um, it's cool to notice that AWS is growing very, very fast. But it's not uh, Amazon as a market cap is growing super fast in the last year because AWS is not only the e-commerce product, but AWS is driving that value in market caps as they are reaching pretty much. They are the leaders in that, and it's a market that can grow for the next 20 years. And, and, and so they estimate it's a 20 billion business if you can divide and put a standalone business on top of um, Amazon uh, commerce. Then there are APIs and extension of the products. So they're actually an extension of the business. Uh, and Evernote is an example where you have an extension of the business. Dropbox is a very good example where you put, put a, basically Dropbox is moving to be an infrastructure company with the release of the new um, data store APIs. So they're basically going to compete with S3 in a way or another. And they're becoming actually a developer platform where you, every time you need storage, you go to Dropbox. And uh, so most of them start as extension. Then they get traction, and they change to be business as a product. Uh, Expedia, I think, uh, yeah, this is a famous quote <laughs> from uh, uh, the John Findout. This is a whole number, but it's, it's really an extension. But you have to think about that if Monk and every kind of apps that build travel and use Expedia API, uh, it, thanks to that, Expedia was able to sell two billions in tickets um, um, through affiliate marketing than through API calls. So imagine any value per API call every time you sell a ticket for, I don't know, business class, 3,500. Bam, one API call, and you cash in 3,500. So it's really high uh, revenue, not high margin, but high revenue API calls for this kind of business. Uh, overall revenue, so that's where the, the difference. In 2007, it was very, very small, and now we're in the order of billions. Uh, Daring Plus and Indirect, uh, this is based on the data that we have. So a lot of companies don't disclose the revenue they're doing. But if, we, if it's some sales for eBay, Amazon, this is a giant market. Think about, actually, I have to ask you a question. What is the most revenue generating API in the world right now? What do you think is the most? Medi? You never thought about this? Like, okay, what is the most successful API business in terms of revenue, not developers, in the world? That's what you start to think about, right? But it's not. You have, it, it's easy, but uh, close. Uh, yeah, but which part of? 
Google AdSense, Google AdWords. So this is the biggest, uh, especially Google AdSense, the biggest, uh, I think 15, 20 billions a year through APIs. And people don't think about it, but it's all up through, API, through APIs. It's the biggest in the world. Uh, I put some slide here. This is what at and have done a study, they've done a conference about APIs. That's my last. And um, basically, in the API addressable market, US only was for them 4 billion, I don't know, but I put it there. It's, uh, I don't know how much <laughs> trustable is that. And also here, they are considering API management business, which as far, it's still, it's still a small business compared to what we talk today. It's around 100 million a year. So it's a pretty small business API management overall. Not, comp not the real business, it's the revenue pull it out by APIs, not the API management. Because a lot of people do things in-house, like uh, Netflix. So that's what I want you to leave this room. We're really, it's a real market, growing fast, and, uh, and it's like gold rush. So the first that will arrive, uh, like Twilio, are the first that will take it all. And, uh, and that's pretty much my talk. And good luck if you need questions, just ask me whatever you want. Thank you. <laughs> Question? You? <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's a good mashup about all the you know John Messers uh, and other um, uh, presentation about the. You hear me? Yeah. Okay. And this uh, powered by the experience of Mache. So correct. So uh, which is a, an, an API marketplace. So 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 thank you. So you finish your your uh, keynote your presentation by your API is your business model. So and you know this phrase of Stephen Wilmot. So. The, um, it's not, um, he said exactly, uh, don't make um, a business model for your API, but make an API that supports your business model. Yeah. So with the experience that you had on my shape, so because he said the opposite kind of. Yeah, I think uh, it's all bullshit at the end, you know. <laughs> you, have a, you have a business and um, you just, uh, you know if, uh, if it's worth uh, adding the API as an additional business or you just have the API as your primary business. But every case is different. You can't really say, like, horizontally, this is how you should do. Every, every case, like Twilio, API is the product, Expedia was an extension. It depends on where the company is and what their goals are internal, what, what the board of directors want to do at the end. It, it, it's a more complex story than just we can summarize in a sentence, but for sure, the message in this both case is still the same, where you can extrapolate billions in revenue through API calls, basically. So, and I would ask uh, a last question, but uh, on my side. Uh, but um, in, in some many, many uh, API advices is, so make a freemium to make the developer test your API and work with it, and then they will go premium. Um, mostly, for example, payments APIs doesn't work like that. Uh, so, from the experience that you have on my shape, what do you think about freemium models? Yeah. And uh, and did you see some? I've seen on on Hacker News many startups say Yo, our API was free. Then we decided to make it paying first without freemium, and it goes better because we don't support people who doesn't pay. So, what is your point of view about that? Yeah, there is actually also the um, I didn't show here, but it's also the free trial, right? That you pay since day one, technically, but you have like two weeks or or thirty days of using for free. That's is cool for SaaS business. For APIs, it's not that that common because in those 30 days, you can run three billions of calls and consume everything. So they may lose a lot of money that will never take it back. So that's why you don't see that. But um, uh, back to your question, the, the, what, what we see uh, in the billing system, like uh, Stripe and things like that, you actually don't need it because they provide an amazing sandbox. They can pretty much play with the product for free. And then when you go to production, go production and, and then it's real money. But they, they created this um, testing sandbox that it's amazing with, the, with faking money, basically. So it's, it's actually kind of giving a free product there, but you're just using fake, you're just faking money. That's how they went around that. But they're still providing a, a free playground to developers anyhow, right? Even if it's a... It's like, a, it's like when you play poker on the web, but without real money. So it's exactly. But it's not real poker. That's actually another, another free trial. You can consider it like that because they invest. But it's true that... Uh, you're gonna waste a lot, a lot of time in customer support on user that do not give you revenue. Okay, thank you.
Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs>